All right, so Pete Davidson, in a what I believe was a recent interview, said that he has borderline personality disorder, or BPD. Should we talk about that? Let's get into it. I want to get deep into this one. Yeah, I think like a lot of times people will go over like symptoms and then they're like, okay, I get it. But I think, we, you know, once again, we, we want to provide a picture of what it actually looks like. Yeah, especially from a, a practical side, because BPD contains a lot of components of a lot of things. It looks like a lot of things. It can look like someone being bipolar. It has tendencies of narcissism. It has all sorts of things. So I'd like to go deep with you, bring your expertise into this and make it very practical. Yeah, and then let, let's preface that we're not pigeon when we're giving exams, we're not pigeonholing it. We're using it as an example to provide context, but there's a whole spectrum and degree to BPD. Yeah, and just a note before we dive in, tons of successful people have BPD. So this is something that really needs to be better understood, and uh, we're going to get there today. Why don't we jump in with the introduction? Welcome to 12 Week Relationships. This is your place for better relationships in weeks, not years. My name is Pi. I'm Dr. Glenn. We hope y'all are enjoying this new set, by the way. And uh, before we get into it, I am going to say that we are now, we just finished week two of our first online cohort. Um, so far, everyone's having a blast. I think yesterday's session was incredible. And if you guys want to be let in on the next enrollment cycle, just join the newsletter. The newsletter is awesome. It contains weekly tips, insights, everything. It's all handwritten stuff. It's good stuff. But join the newsletter at 12weekrelationships.com and uh, that would be awesome. That was that was the word from our sponsor because we are our own sponsor. Our sponsor says we are awesome. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Which is us. <laughs> okay. oh, but it's been amazing. Yeah. It has been. And it's been uh, an awesome journey with you, brother. Thanks, man. A little fist bump. Let's get into now BPD. BPD is such an interesting thing because I feel like it can be confused. And and just to preface this, we're going to go through a series of kind of steps in this in this podcast episode in this video. Um, but we're going to talk about what it is, what it's not. We're going to go into what it looks like on the outside. What are the practical issues, the symptoms, everything, as well as like how you approach and kind of treat. Right? How do you have discussions with people that have BPD? Yeah, and then once again, I just want to strongly preface this, like we're not pigeonholing it when we give examples, we're just trying to give it context. So there's understanding and then there's a whole degree and spectrum of what it is. Totally. Well, yes. why don't we start with uh, that clinical definition? So basically it's, it's a mental health disorder. Um, it's often called like unstable personality disorder and it comes usually from trauma that you you know you experienced in childhood. It's usually very, very severe. Mm -hmm. um, and then in your everyday life, like it comes out in like unstable relationships, there's extreme behaviors, there's chaotic impulses, there's like you mentioned, there's like there's a narcissistic component, but then there's there's fear of abandonment. And it's just kind of like this chaotic space that's continually established throughout all of their relationships. Yeah, when I first learned about BPD, I, I honestly had a a difficult time trying to wrap my head around the clinical definition of it because BPD looks like so many different things and how do you know and then as I started kind of unraveling the word itself like borderline personality disorder when I started unraveling that it actually helped me to really understand what was kind of going on and to me at least for me a, a simpler explanation of it is if you think of the term borderline personality what this essentially is, is like someone whose personality is not really in any clearly defined bucket. They're borderline. They're on the lines of mm -hmm. like kind of jumping around in terms of that. That was at least something that helped me a lot. No, that, that's a great example. That's a great definition. And the way I would, I would even preface it further is like you're on the border. So the, the line between like healthy and unhealthy mm -hmm. and you're constantly towing that line. And especially when it's required for you to make healthy choices, that's where all of the sabotage and chaos comes into play. Yeah. Now, a huge piece of what you mentioned, like uh, most of this is due to traumatic childhood elements. And maybe you can actually, from some of our clinical work case studies, can you outline practically what that looks like? What does that look like from a childhood scenario? So for example, like, you know, let me ask you, right? Like the way, the way you grew up, right? Like, you know, you always go back to what you know. So for example, like, Maybe like, oh, I, I really liked my hometown. So maybe you go, go back to your hometown when you become an adult or you pick a city that's similar to your hometown. So once again, you just go back to what you know. Mm -hmm. 
if you grew up in a very chaotic home, a very abusive home, right? There's usually like a lot of like possibly like sexual abuse and physical abuse and there's drug use and all everything is chaotic. You're internalizing that and that's what you know, right? So as a kid, you're going to disconnect from your body. You're going to disconnect from your mind. You're trying to make just try to survive and you're coming to terms with everything. Mm -hmm. So as you become an adult and you start making choices in your life, especially like these important choices, you're going to go back to what you know and you're going to go back to that chaotic space and that chaotic impulse. And there's an inability to not choose otherwise. Yeah. From a practical standpoint, I think that can be created in a number of ways. But what you're really looking at is in childhood, life is borderline, right? It, it's not ever one thing. There is no sense of consistent stability. It's dealing with, you know, physical abuse and then emotional abuse and then being in poverty. And then it's this constant lack of a, a consistent routine or or being stable that leads to it, which which also means like you can develop bpd from not necessarily direct abuse but neglect across like like let's say that you have a parent that completely is is dismissive maybe a single parent that's dismissive and you're constantly moving from one place to another because maybe your parent works for the military maybe they have a job that requires them to go all over the place so they're not only away from home quite often when they do get home, there might be like a, a sense of not understanding. I, I go back to, I don't have, uh, you know, I don't have, I, there were certain elements of my childhood that were stable, certain ones that were unstable. But one of the things was like when I go back and I think about it, I never could understand uh, what mood my father would be in when he would get home. He was a single father. Uh, I, I love him tremendously. He's done such a wonderful job. But if you just think about being a single father in a country that is new to you, and having to work full time and provide and study and do everything plus raise a child, you can imagine the stress. So for me, um, I develop things around being hypersensitive to his emotional state, right? But there was stability in my school, in the friends, in, in being in one place where there was something that I could rely on. I knew my dad was coming home every day. Like I knew that, that he wasn't ever gonna. So if you take a few of those things away, like, now you have a parent that's a single parent. You're moving around quite often. They're dismissive, not because they don't love you, but it's because uh, they're just too busy trying to take care of you and the household. And you don't have a sense of consistency among anything around you. Then you essentially never get to a place where you start developing your personality. It, what you end up doing is you just do whatever it takes to survive. And you will be whoever you need to be to survive. Yeah, so that's why, you know, that fear of abandonment or there's no sense of identity, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, once again, like in that example, like anybody, like, you know, everyone does like borderline traits once in a while. Like, for example, like, let's say you have a great job opportunity and then you sabotage it, right? Like you, you go against it or you go back to something that you know, like that's a form of self-sabotage, right? Sure. But that doesn't mean you're borderline. However, like borderline is you're in this state all the time in every single moment of every day and then there's all these opportunities and it's just chaos after chaos everywhere that you go yeah yeah and the another practical aspect if we were to bring this into like core value focus therapy like the what we do in our modality what we tend to notice with um with patients with clients not patients clients uh, i want to say students but they're not really students either clients and members of the program that are um that that might have bpd is that they tend to not really have any clearly defined core values. That's one of the, that's kind of one of the symptoms of it. Other than, again, that overriding need for safety, security. It's the survival mechanism. You mentioned that. Correct. Correct. And then this is where the borderline comes into play. To get that safety, they're doing the opposite of what's creating the safety. They're actually sabotaging the safety, but expecting safety in return anyways. Mm -hmm. And that's what causes all of that chaos. Mm -hmm. Right. So like if you picture it like, you know, it's, you know, we're going to get into this more, but like, you know, the treatment is like doing opposite action. So if the environment, the emotions are opening up, then the person on the inside that has borderline is going to start shrinking their emotions down. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, if it's the, sh if the emotions, you know, there's no emotions and they're going to expand, expand it out and everything is opposite. This is where all the chaos continuously takes place. Yeah. It's a, it's a difficult place to be because if your overriding need is safety and security if that's the one thing that you value and need more than anything 
the characteristic of someone that has BPD is that they will be anyone and anything to get that one thing satisfied. And that's why they're not developing other core values. They're not developing other, you know, like uh, sense of morality and other traits because it's purely survival and whatever is needed. So that's why from the outside, it can appear as though this person is so wishy-washy like they go from hot and cold and they switch jobs and they they go from one relationship to the next and they can't ever find that sense of like security that they're seeking and what we see from the outside is oftentimes we, we would describe it you know colloquially as they seem crazy yeah but but even taking it further they do have safety like the person is like everything in their environment is safe but then they're pushing the people around them to the borderline of are you going to stay or are you going to leave? You're going to abandon me or you're going to give me safety even though I'm doing all these things to sabotage it and cause chaos in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is a, a really interesting one. So overall, just to kind of summarize that definition kind of point is borderline personality disorder is the lack of a consistent personality set of values. The, the existence of this chaos in a person's kind of identity. Yeah, an unstable personality disorder that's being developed. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we go into what it's not or what it can be confused for? Because there's a lot of elements that are included in BPD. Yeah, so oftentimes people, you know, if a person has borderline personality disorder because you have these extreme moods, mm -hmm. so oftentimes they'll get diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but it isn't mm -hmm. bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is a mood disorder. It's a chemical imbalance where your, your mood fluctuates from like a high too low and oftentimes it can't be controlled it's a chemical reaction the environment can trigger it but then you take medications and you try and stable out your stabilize your mood right and then oftentimes people with borderline personality disorder because a lot of insurance companies won't treat them right because it takes so many years of treatment the clinician will diagnose them with bipolar disorder so that they can get some treatment mm -hmm. instead interesting yeah wouldn't you say that bipolar and it's funny how they sound similar too so bipolar disorder um wouldn't you say that bipolar is more chemically kind yeah, of yeah it's a it's a chemical it's chemically charged like it's hard to control like your your environment can trigger the moods yeah. but ultimately it's a chemical imbalance that's why medication management is hugely important yeah the the tricky thing about bpd is that while it can look like bipolar it's not it's not necessarily chemical based but you can actually have bpd and be bipolar which would be pretty gnarly but given that it's not chemically induced it's not your body that's that's doing this to you it's your the environment that you grew up in and all these things that you'd learned and all the stress and coping mechanisms that you were developing i, I wish it were as simple as bipolar to address you know a medication can very much help someone that's bipolar whereas on the bpd side it requires quite a bit more it seems yeah so i mean bipolar like you know what it is it's the moods and then the treatment is the meds and then okay when you're in your downswing these are the things that you need to do maybe exercise more you know, be around friends, watch comedy shows when you're on this uptake, right? Okay, maybe you're more busy and be proactive during that time. So there's a plan, but there's no, you're not trying to, they're not trying to sabotage themselves in that process. Okay. Now, what about narcissism? Because I still have a hard time saying that word, by the way, narcissism. Does, there's, there's a lot of traits in BPD that look like narcissism. Well, narcissist, you know, the personality disorder spectrum, like, you know, Nar uh, narcissistic personality disorder borderline antisocial they all they all contain components of narcissism mm -hmm. right so then there there's similar characteristics but then there's varying degrees of where that narcissism and those traits go yeah so we would from my understanding and and this is where you'll start to see my limitations in my knowledge set because i don't have your 20 years of clinical experience on this but to me when i look at it it, it feels like you have narcissism on one side then the next level of that would be like like you would ratchet it up basically when you have bpd um, and then you would go to the next step with being like completely antisocial behaviors but it's all this kind of spectrum of behavior yeah so you know we covered like narcissism right mm -hmm. and we talked about the vulnerable narcissist right they grew up in a very crappy upbringing borderline abusive home so they developed this narcissism like people owe me or you should do this for me mm -hmm. right and the reason they're they're doing that is they're in their pain they can feel their trauma right a personality disorder, it goes beyond, like it, it goes to the space where you're, it's beyond the trauma, like it's that bad, mm -hmm. where they don't even feel, it's almost like they don't even respond to the trauma or they forget things really, really quickly. So like mm -hmm. I could, we can be cussing each other out and have the worst fight and then two minutes later, we're good, right? 
and I'll act like nothing ever happened, right? So that's that's the that's the line between like narcissism to a personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it it seems like it stems from going back to again case studies. It would be narcissism due to neglect, due to you know abuse, due to all these different things. The the um, vulnerable narcissist, right? That develops in the home that you described, where you're you're receiving that type of attention, abuse, whatever it might be from your parents. But then you add to that the element of instability, the element of constant change, of constant fear, of all of those pieces. Then you get a narcissist that is has borderline. Correct. And then the borderline where the narcissism comes in for them is I'm sabotaging everything. I'm causing chaos in your life. And I still expect you to stay with me and provide safety for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's a very narcissistic trait. Mm-hmm. But someone that has BPD, when they create that chaos, I think it's important to understand from the outside, you know, you might use a term like just colloquially, you might think that this person is crazy. Um, we want to be sensitive to words like that. Labels, I think, are I, I think labels have a purpose. Like like it is helpful to understand what it is that we perceive a certain thing, you know, like crazy to us is wishy-washy going one way than the other and then not having any sort of consistency. That is crazy. But what is happening internally on the inside for them is this is normal for them. This yeah, is what they know. That's what they know. And and to give it more context, like for example, if there was chaos in this room, like we were all fighting with each other, right? Like you could feel the tension in the room. How would you feel on the inside? I would feel chaotic on the inside too. Yeah, right. Because it's matching the environment. Like it's really uncomfortable. So you're going to feel uncomfortable, mm-hmm. right? For the person with a borderline personality disorder, it's the opposite. It's chaotic on the outside now they feel comfortable on Mm. the inside versus if it's calm on the outside then you feel calm on the inside right but Mm -hmm. it's going to be reversed for them then then they start to feel really really chaotic and this is also why they can have a really difficult time finding stability in jobs and relationships and friendships and family relationships because anytime there is that sense of stability and calm there's the inside chaos chaos. comes out right Mm -hmm. so that's where you know the opposite actions and then the self-sabotaging comes into play Mm -hmm. It's interesting when we describe it it's like i can i can see elements of that within my own life but that i've i'll give you an example of this and i've learned over time to just not act on certain impulses um i had a conversation about this yesterday with a friend but this was a, a different one where uh, you know like uh, in 2020 there was a lot of things going on but in those moments where where we were literally locked down and there was like nothing to do. Um, I know my mind well enough. Like if I'm vacationing and and just sitting on a beach is very stressful to me. You give me like a a calm beach where I'm just looking at the ocean and I'm having a hard time. Give me a book to read and I'm okay. But I need to occupy my mind because I know that if if I'm in that environment of just pure calm, I feel chaotic inside. Um... I, I know in 2020, I, I knew that this was happening because when we were all on lockdown, I was like, you know, this isn't good for me. Like I, I need to actually keep my mind going, but I could feel that chaos building. Mm-hmm. And when you speak of it, it, it reminds me of, of BPD, but obviously to not in a, a, any level of extreme. And I could find a lot of elements of my own childhood where I had that kind of instability and whatnot. But what would you say that is? Is that is that some lower level of BPD? Is it so p- people have borderline traits, right? So like you know you're providing like on the spectrum. I think a lot of people have they sabotage their own lives in many ways, or then when good things happen, they they feel chaotic, right? Like yeah. oh I don't deserve it. That is, that is a characteristic of being borderline, right? It's on the lower level. There's a trait of it. it doesn't mean you have it, but there's traits and characteristics that people have, and I think the majority of people do, and then. It ratchets it ratchets ratchets it up to the higher end. Oh, I mean the the chaos and the symptoms that I was feeling were completely self sabotage type. I even I even talked to you about some of them at one point where I I would tell you like sometimes in my head I'm so angry I'm so upset that I want to blow it all up like like you know what I'm just going to go do business on my own. But then I've learned over time to realize that okay I'm not thinking rationally and to realize that. My business partnership is actually pretty awesome mm-hmm. and I'm upset with one thing or there's one thing that's not going right. But that's where I, I feel like that's where the borderline personality goes is when you take it to a, a higher degree, there is no 
tool or ability to control that sensation that that being you know being upset over a small thing and willing to blow something up that would completely destroy you know it'd be harmful to me mm -hmm. that's not a good thing but when you're in that place you don't see it that way and you don't have the tools to be able to understand that okay this is not the right approach yeah and and, and in that example that you provided like you're able to like see three different perspectives right like i could see if i go out on my own or this is painful but I also see the alternatives, like you're seeing multiple truths all at once. That was only because of my background in psychology. Like I could, ex I could explain to you what was happening. And, and this was, um, truth be told, this was when, when you asked me to be a partner. So this was like about a year ago, you asked me to be a partner. And I said, you know what, why don't I just hire you as my coach and therapist and see how you work? Because I want to make sure that this was what we would do. I was like, okay, these are some of the things that I'm still dealing with and I would present them to you. The only reason that I'm able to have tools and to explain them was because of my background in psychology, but most people don't, most people haven't spent this much time studying this kind of stuff. So what do they do? They just keep doing what they know, right? So like in that example, they would continue to keep self-sabotaging. Which would basically mean like you get upset at your, that's one of the issues that it was 2020, 2021-ish, and there was like this, everyone was on edge. Everyone was stressed out, like all the stuff that was going on. And there was a lingering resentment. And I, I came to you and I was like, this is such a small thing. Why am I thinking so binary, like a, a zero or one? Like, this is a small issue, but because of that, everything's not working. Or, you know, like that's a, a binary thought process, right? Mm -hmm. One thing's in, out of place, everything's not working. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying because you're showing the potential that anyone can go to that space. But I think in your example, if you had borderline characteristics, that emotion of wanting to quit or to say, I can't handle this, it feels like it, everyone's against you and you just cannot control your, you're so in your feelings. Mm -hmm. And then even though like we're talking, you're like, yeah, what about these other alternatives? You're like, no. And you went to all your partners and you cussed them out. Mm -hmm. Or like, you did me wrong and you just went around. Like that would be, that would be the point where like you're you're going or just that. quit be like i'm done I'm, I'm but that's exactly what i wanted you to point out because i think as we talk through this we can all recognize elements of bpd of narcissism of each of these things in our own lives and it's important to distinguish between what we would say someone that's actually would be diagnosed with bpd versus someone that may have traits like we all can have traits of these things yeah and so you're right you're right so instead of saying like oh you're just crazy like we can all look at our own lives and be like oh i could see myself going there Correct. and especially if, if this was like my upbringing or like maybe there's a genetic component or combined i could see and, and show and have empathy because yeah, i could possibly see myself doing the same thing and the other beautiful thing about the word crazy is that you know it, it is a label but if you think about it from the standpoint of all of us are maybe one two three experiences away from crazy like yeah. there was a very small shift in what you've experienced or what maybe happens to you can push you towards exactly what that is yeah and then even in society a lot of things was considered normal it's kind of crazy too right so mm -hmm. you know what is what is normal anyway normal's overrated yeah that's what it is okay so i think we've covered kind of what it's not there was one other element that i did want to talk about which was what it can also look like is adhd right this yeah. inability to kind of focus and be consistent no it, it could definitely look like that i i want to give an example i just want to give a context so like when i was at my internship and then they were like okay you're gonna have a client that has borderline they were like "Ooh, good luck with that and i was like okay so i was reading the symptomology like unstable mood or you know, oh, you know, they fear abandonment. So I just kind of, because I've never seen a periodic, I don't, I don't understand what it was. And they're like, good luck with that. So everyone's like really animated. And I was like, okay, cool, man. And then I was like, thanks. And so I went in there, met this person, you know, she, you know, she's a woman and she's in her sweats. And she was like, oh, I, I suffer from anxiety. And I was, she was just talking a lot. She, and then every once in a while she would say like some kind of like crazy thing. And I was just doing this assessment. And she's like, are you new? And she was asking me all these questions. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm new. And so I just need anxiety for meds. So I was like, okay, cool. So I was like, cool, like this is this is what borderline is? Cool, man, no big deal, right? So then I left and then she's like, when are you gonna be back? And I go, I'm gonna be back Thursday. She come, I come back Thursday, she comes back in a dress, makeup, she had cuts on her arm and she looks at me and she's like in the room, she's like, hey you, you motherfucker, look what you did. 
right? As they were sitting there, and I just saw her like she was really quiet with the sweats on the, on that Tuesday. Like, hey, I just need to. Oh, I like you. You're you're a nice intern. And then it went to, you motherfucker. Look what happened. Wow. Right. And then I never forgot this. She was like, do you understand what I went through in my life? And I had never understood any of this before, right? So I was like, no, right? So I, it was like this emotional tornado. And she was like, looking at me, she had like the darting eyes. She was looking at my reaction. And I'll never forget this. She goes, do you know what it's like when someone tries to stick a dick in your eye? And then I jumped back. I was like, no, I do not know. I was like, no, right? And she's like, do you know what it's like when they try to stick it in your ear? And then she looked at me like this, right? And then I went back like this, right? And then I was like, frozen right and then she's like you go get the goddamn psychiatrist right now right i need my medications right now right so i was like okay so then i ran to the psychiatrist right i ran to the supervisor i was like dude she, she has a cut on her arm she's threatening all these things and then so then I went to the psychiatrist right got the appointment right so then she went to the psychiatrist and then she went at the psychiatrist she's like this guy doesn't know shit this intern sucks this stupid motherfucker doesn't know anything da, 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 da. she was going off she took her meds then she came back to me and she's like, that, that that psychiatrist is a piece of shit. What the hell kind of clinic is this? I'm gonna write you motherfuckers up. You fucking loser, you don't know shit, right? And then she left, right? And yeah. then they were like, congratulations, man. You had your first borderline client, right? And then so it was one thing to read it yeah. and then it was another thing to have that experience. And I was like, oh my God, this is what? Like this is on the higher end, but this is what an example of borderline was. Well, the other side of that too is the next time you saw her, she probably acted like nothing happened. Yeah, she acted like nothing. Hey, how's it going, yeah. right? It was like, you know, and then that's when like I had to learn the therapy models. But then when she came back again, you know, and we're, we can get into this later, but when she's like, I told you about the dick in my eye, right? And then this time I was ready. I was like, yeah, but you can still see, right? How you doing? And then I didn't react. I told you about the ear. Yeah, but you can still hear, right? Oh, good. That's good. Right. So we can we can do this. And then I remember there was a point where she's like, fuck you. I hate you. And then there was no reaction because it was like staying calm. It's like, OK, you could hate me, but let's try to work this out. So it was boundary setting, multiple perspectives. And then we actually started to develop a relationship. And then, you know, I saw her over like one year of my internship placement. But that was like the process of understanding, like, this is why people are like, oh, what is this? Or the, you know, a lot of times the criteria doesn't do it justice for what it is. Yeah. What you mentioned, um, so the way that Dr. Glenn was actually responding to that person might sound cold. Uh, that's actually called dialectic therapy. Uh, I don't know where I'm looking right now. <laughs> dialectic therapy. So that's basically where, you know, when they're looking for a reaction, when they're looking for a response, you simply don't respond. You basically just accept, redirect, and, and practice mindfulness, right? Multiple things can be true at the same time. So you're not reacting, you're boundary setting, you're giving them the options to open up their perspectives correct. and you're deflecting back. And and it this story, I'm, I'm smiling because the story sounds comical, but it's also important to recognize that what she is describing are very likely real experiences that actually happened. She did, yeah. So those are things that would actually happen to somebody. But this happens a lot with people that um, I, I have noticed that have BPD is there's a whenever they're seeking support or guidance or help, there's that need to just get you to react and to the words of like, you don't understand what it's like. You don't know what it's like to be me, to have gone through this. And they go into all these different examples. And it's almost like it's a, it's a broken record that um, I have a friend that I don't think he is... Uh, actually diagnosed with BPD, but I, I've talked to him. I'm like, I, I am almost 100% certain that if you went to a clinical psychologist, they would diagnose you with BPD. But for 20 years, it's been the same record. And it's each time we talk and try to give support, it's, but you don't know what it's like. And eventually, like four or five years ago, I just said, look, you're never going to find somebody that knows what it's like. There is no person that knows what it's like to be you because you've only had those experiences. But many of us around you have had similar experiences. And if you can't learn from us and from your own, and if this is what you require is someone to perfectly understand what you've been through, you're never going to get past this because that person doesn't exist. Now, you as the psychologist would probably laugh at this because you know exactly how that advice was taken and received. Any logical person would be like, you know what, you're right. But that's not what a person with BPD does. 
Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure he was very gracious about it, right? He was very gracious in the moment, and then yeah. another five years of just yeah. repeating all the same yeah. stuff. Yeah, and I, I could name off twenty instances of him walking me through the exact same experiences of like he would say, "But you don't understand what it's like," and I would say, "Well, tell me." Just out of sheer morbid curiosity on my side, is he going to repeat the same story again? And he would, the same hour-long life story each time yeah and that's the thing like you're just in this emotional tornado and it's like you can never get out when you're with this person yeah and it's the same stories over and over and over again so let's go back to what this looks like we, we kind of know what it looks like on the outside um we're seeing that more clearly but i don't think people understand that bpd can actually be a trait that makes a lot of people quite successful like there's a lot of actors, entertainers, entrepreneurs, CEOs that actually have BPD. And in many ways, it could be serving what they're doing. Well, the other thing, too, is a lot of highly successful people, like they'll attract partners that have BPD, mm -hmm. right? Because they're successful. They want a confident partner. And there's a lot of like that narcissistic confident traits and it's exciting and there's an exuberance to them. And then the things that they do, it's like, it's like, wow, I can't believe you're doing that. So that it gets mistaken for confidence or this is exciting. But you're actually in for, or, you know, into a long-term relationship with this person that has BPD. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it, like you said, it's it's it looks charismatic. It looks like someone that's highly confident. It looks like an an entertainer. It, it's not a surprise. Like if you think about what very charming. Yeah, very yeah. charming. Like it, it's all those things that can actually help someone to be successful. But it's also, if you think of a lifestyle that would match. Let's see if we're on the same wavelength here. Think of a job and lifestyle that would match what borderline personality disorder is. What would you think of? Just a really high level stress job. Is there a specific job? For borderline? Yeah. There's one that I can think of that, I mean, I'm not sure there's many, but. You're talking about like acting or what? Yeah. Yeah. Actors and actresses. You're constantly on the move. You're never in one place. You're always on location. You're always going to a different place. You got to go in a hotel. You got to be in this place. You got to be all over the place. You never are really interacting with many of the same people beyond maybe just your agent, maybe one person, but you're always working with different people constantly. You're literally required to be a different person. All the time. All the time. No, that is true. And it, it in every way lines up to this. And then we start to wonder, why is it that? entertainers and actors and everybody has such a difficult time maintaining relationships no because the environment mimics a lot of chaotic tendencies it sure. literally feeds each other no for sure like they're they're bpd because if you put a normal person in that environment right like it not i, I shouldn't use the term normal because that's again a label but if you put somebody that values stability that that wants to be in one place wants to spend time with their family like if this is they want a consistency and a pattern of routines you force that someone to be an actor or an actress they're going to very much hate that job unless they can, you know, somehow eat their way into being like, you know, a tonight show host where it's the same mm -hmm. thing each and every night. Right. You're right. But you're, you're right. Like reality shows they they promote train wrecks and emotional chaos and All instability. The, the, the whole premise is to have an unstable, t unstable personality. Well, and what happens yeah. to the people that are stable? They get their asses kicked off the shows. You're, you're not normal, man. You, you don't you don't belong here. Get the yeah. hell out of here. If you're watching yeah. like any of these dating shows, what was yeah. the one that we were analyzing? Love is blind. Love right? is blind. The normal ones got kicked off. Yeah. yeah. All the ones that were like stable. <laughs> the healthy ones. They got kicked <laughs> off. And you're left with everybody that basically has BPD, narcissism, ADHD, like which traumas. It's yeah. things that we all have. I, yeah. I, I get that. But like what I'm really pointing out is that there is certain jobs and roles that actually benefit from somebody that has a limited, a certain amount of control over their borderline personality disorder. And one of those is acting. One of those is entertaining, being a musician that has to travel and do concerts and again, be on tour and constantly doing those different things. And the ones that you, that, that don't have that trait, the ones that are more stable, generally burn out. They're doing a tour, a movie, taking a long period of time off. Well, the other thing too is a lot of actors, um, 
there's a lot of actors that suffer from bipolar disorder. Like mm-hmm. they call it baby bipolar. Like move, you know, when they're like, man, they're so into their role. Yeah. Well, because of the the upswing in, in their mood, right? And then they're like really into that role. So it also feeds into bipolar as well. Yeah. Yeah. So if if there's a for people that do struggle with BPD, for me, uh, you know, I have ADHD, right? I I often kind of like for, from my standpoint, from my viewpoint, it's not so much about re, like like resolving, removing. I don't feel like that's possible. To me, it feels like learning how to control and imagine, uh, uh, manage it as well as utilizing it. I utilize my ADHD. It makes me really good at what I do. So like if I were to remove it, I wouldn't be able to do what I do in business and education and all those things. So it becomes a, a balance of tools and managing as opposed to like trying to eliminate entirely. I guess I'm saying that there can be benefits to any one of these things as long as you have the adequate tools to manage it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely having the, the tool set, the skill sets, but also recognizing like, man, you must have went through a lot in your life For to sure. get to this space, right? For sure. So giving yourself grace, um, but then also taking responsibility and then being educated about it and then making sure that you learn to make the best choices for yourself. You're not acting on every emotional impulse or making decisions that are bad for you. You start working toward a healthier version of yourself. Yeah, and I'm also speaking from the standpoint of someone that can learn, gain the tools, and and be sometimes medication is, is involved and whatnot. But I'm speaking from the standpoint of treatable syndromes, right? As opposed to there can be genetic variants and untreatable versions of this. Yeah, I mean, they've done studies on it, right? So like, if you look at like, there's like a two, 2015 and 2016 study on remission rates. At, usually, you know, people with BPD is like 10 to 30 years of treatment. So usually 16 years of treatment, there's a 60% remission rate. 27 years of treatment is a 92% remission rate. Jeez, 27 so it takes years. 27, and you're dealing with like dialectic therapy, which is the approach two to three times a week plus group because you have to process all of that emotional regulation that's taking place inside of you. Did that study determine like length of treatment based on the age of when they started treatment? Yeah, they usually started like when they were younger. And this is so people that are saying like therapy works, like it definitely helps. I think it helps. But the naysayers are kind of like it's minimal. And basically, it's just age as you get older because you get mm-hmm. tired and you physically get, you know, you're not you don't you're not as energetic and as spry. Mm-hmm. So then just the, the chaotic impulses start to slow down. So that's kind of the counter argument. So it's hard to see what component of that is just age versus what component is actually the, the, therapy, the therapy that's itself. helping. Yeah, so you can argue like, yeah, it's the 27 years of effective therapy that got you to that space. The, the other people say, well, it had some effect, but ultimately it's just age. Just like, I would imagine, I know it's difficult to, it's probably, there are probably no studies that are able to do this, but I'd imagine that if you were to be able to start treating um, a child that might be identified with BPD. Earlier. You know, maybe at eight, nine, 10 years old, that it would become successful before they're, you know, yeah, early and in- fully grown adults, but it's hard to identify that early and it's hard to treat it early. Yeah, an early intervention in anything is key. The yeah. earlier you start, the better. Okay, should we go into, um, we've talked about a lot of the symptoms of BPD, but specifically mm-hmm. this sort of emotional tornado. Yeah, so I mean, once again, it's just when you're with that person, it, everything just feels chaotic and it feels out of control so like let's say like from your perspective or that person's perspective from the outside perspective Mm. from the people that they're around right Mm -hmm. so like let's say you know you and i were married but then i'm cheating on you with another person and then i also you know i'm in another relationship and then i would the smart thing to do would to be to keep it separate right Mm -hmm. but let's say i throw a party at my house i invite you I invite the person I'm cheating with and I invite the other person that I'm seeing as well. Mm. And here's all together in the house. How would you feel knowing the dynamic that's taking? How would you feel? I think you're insane. You think I'm insane? But me, I'm calm on the inside. Yeah. <laughs> cool. What's, what's the problem, man? What the hell's wrong with you? Have a drink, man. Everything's cool, man. You good? You good? We good, man. And so it doesn't match what's happening, right? It's the opposite yeah. effect, right? So you're kind of like, oh, but inside I'm like, I'm like, cool, man. <laughs> What's up, man? What's up? What's up? Do you all meet each other? What's the problem? It's hilarious because I'm I'm thinking of like, you know, you're the college partying buddy, the one that like, this is very much, and not to say that every party person is this, but it is a trait of BPD to be that one friend that just doesn't give a shit about anything. Like they, 
their whole world can be falling apart, but they're always just ready to have a good time. Like, doesn't matter. Finals coming up, doesn't matter. I'm ready to have a good time. I'll figure it out. Yeah, but th this is even, like, in that example, it's beyond having a good, it's just chaos. That is insane. To, this to, is chaos emerging, and then I'm just sitting here calm, like, cool, man. And what's, you're getting upset. This person's uncomfortable, and I'm like, we're good, man. We I need to good. say this, because I don't think people understand. When we give examples, um, every time we tell a story, dick in your eye, dick in your ear, when we tell a story about, you know, uh, inviting your your spouse and the people that you're cheating with to the same party, these aren't examples that are fictitious, like coming out of our minds. These are actual sure. examples of things that we have dealt with, that you have dealt with Working in with clinical clients work. directly, yeah. Yes. These are these are situations, and these are the the partners that have BPD. Yeah, and these are the circumstances that are taking place. I I, I say that because yeah. they sound wild. Like it, it literally sounds like, uh, as you were saying it, I'm like I gotta clarify this because if someone's just listening to this, they probably think you're making this stuff up. No, no, no. And then, for example, like in that example, then the next day you're stressed out. What's the problem, man? Everything's good, right? What's your deal, <laughs> right? And then, you know, it's just, it's just, and then you're, all, you're trying to please. And then finally you're about to leave. Then I'm like, oh, you're the best. I cuss you out. Then the next moment, oh, you're the best. Please stay. Don't leave me. Yeah. It's just this teeter totter effect. It it's goes like the to all or nothing. Gaslighting. <laughs> and it's just chaos. You could feel the tension in the air always. Like it's never stable. And that's how you know that you're, you're with a person with BPD because it never feels stable. It's always uncomfortable. It feels chaotic all the time. Everything's going, especially when things start to calm down, then something crazy will happen. Then you could, you know, the stories, they'll be like, I could feel it. Like everything's calm. And then instinctually, I know something bad's going to happen. This person's going <laughs> to fuck this shit up. They're going to fuck this shit up because it's how it goes. It's too calm. And then something crazy happens. And that's the cycle of being with the person that's suffering. With yeah. BPD. yeah. The wild thing from the, the person that's suffering, from the person that's with someone with BPD they generally are unable to walk away without forms of PTSD. <laughs> like you yeah, will there, have. There's trauma and then the abuse component because then you start to over identify and start thinking like them. The Correct. Stockholm syndrome comes into play, right? And then and then almost like, what the, what the fuck is going on? Am I crazy or, I, you know, and then you're so far invested. Well, I can't turn back now. And you yeah. start, you start becoming a part of that emotional tornado too. And it's hard to get out. I want to sp speak on that for a second because in terms of like the the symptoms we've talked a lot about the, the negative symptoms but why is it that a person would get into a relationship with someone with bpd it, it goes back to a lot of the things that we've said there are a lot of elements of bpd that make someone charismatic they make them likable they make them fun loving a partier someone that just likes to have a good time it's it's all of these different pieces but there's the so those are attractive elements in a person Mm -hmm. And then you get together with them for a physical relationship and, and well, I'm saying romantic relationship, but the dad in me is like thinking physical, um, but you start having sex with this person and the sex is incredible because when they're in it and they're, you know, they're, it's an amazing, but it's this constant roller coaster of this. When they're in it, it's incredible. Everything's amazing. The sex is awesome. We're on the same wavelength. You imagine all that fixation and focus is all on you in those moments and then you go to those other extremes where it's like, oh yeah, I cheated, but why are you so upset about it? I hate you, what's going on? Why are you leaving? What? This is your problem. And they just keep blaming you for everything going on the attack. Yeah. And then when you confront them, they'll act victimized. And then it's just this teeter totter. It's just, it's just never, nothing is ever resolved. Yeah, but that, that excitement of this constant ups and downs, mm -hmm. again, I want everybody to start recognizing that what is this mirror? drug abuse it mirrors like the ups and downs that you would get almost identically especially when you look at from a hormonal standpoint from a chemical standpoint what is producing in the body is similar to being on a very potent drug having it having cocaine the high taking it away cocaine taking yeah, the it withdrawal away. the addiction the back and forth it's you're, you're almost addicted to the drama so if you have a friend that's in a relationship with someone that has bpd and you're always wondering like why is it why do they it's important to look at this from that lens to be able to understand what it is that they're experiencing. And if you're going through it yourself to be able to understand why is it that breaking off such a toxic relationship can still be so painful, it's because of that withdrawal effect that now I'm taking away all that 
when it the, those highs when it was high it was incredible and when it was low it was low but i miss those highs but also i mean there's there's an abuse component to absolutely to it too right so your esteem is being chipped away so then it's, absolutely once you start doubting yourself like that person is broken right borderline is like they're broken they have a shattered sense of self so you're you're being with this person your sense of self is becoming shattered too so now you have the it's you're right like it's the addicted like you're so addicted at this point you can't even see clearly and you have to break the addiction and then get yourself out yeah it's a, it's a hard place to get out of it's a difficult cycle to break and then when that person does what we're describing in the remaining ptsd from the healthy partner right they don't walk away from it completely intact and healthy they walk away with this post-traumatic stress disorder where now when they actually find a healthy relationship they're very likely to question it because it's not exciting there's no chemistry it's not you know we don't have the highs it's just this it's just okay. In reality, what they're perceiving is a healthy relationship, but they're comparing it to the highs and the lows of being on this roller coaster, the the cocaine, the withdrawal. Yeah, and that's a sign that they still have all that residue inside of them that they need to get rid of. Correct. Yeah, they still have that addicted mind, they still have that cocaine, <laughs> that addiction, and they gotta get that they gotta get that out of their mind and start seeing more clearly. We use the word cocaine because there was a study done that that showed that cocaine is the love drug like when you are in love and you're feeling the symptoms of like you know that chemistry and the mm -hmm. the want and the and then the taking away of it and that withdrawal yeah. it mirrors actually from a chemical standpoint what you feel when you're on cocaine yeah and, and the, the, you know i think you brought up the question like why do you choose that partner like usually the upbringing you have a very chaotic upbringing you have a healthy narcissism about yourself and you become very successful in life mm -hmm. so when you're picking a partner and you meet someone that has borderline traits you're like you said they're so attractive and they're so bold and you're so drawn to them right and then it flips to like why are you treating me so badly and you're this very successful person and it messes with your mind and then all of a sudden you're just kind of sucked in yeah yeah okay let's go into the um decision making aspect of it so going into the mind of of the person that has bpd the difficulty in keeping a job and and relationships and doing what and doing what's actually beneficial to them because they're constant self-sabotaging what, what do you want to go into exactly well what's going on in their heads in terms of like in that decision it's difficult to get like for a healthy person it's difficult to put themselves in the mind of someone that has bpd because we don't think that way we we realize that like um, and i'll give you an example um my the the example that i gave of my friend uh he was on government support yeah and i said you know what you just need to you need to find a job a job that you can just be consistent with make that your baseline because he's trying to do all these things like like start a business and do all these different things right my my thing was just find a basic job whatever it is i go because how does it feel being on government support he's like it feels like shit. And i go it's going to constantly affect your confidence your ability to your 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 own self-regard the image that you have of yourself that's going to constantly be impacted so don't worry about starting a business don't worry about going and back to school and getting a you know doctorate degree all these things that are just so far beyond the, the step one just something consistent and that's what i was kind of aiming for step one just one thing that's consistent in your life and uh from the outside from our perspective it's very easy to see like okay step one is just finding one small level of consistency getting off support being able to like kind of sustain yourself and then kind of adding a second layer and if you're strength training in the gym you'd start at five pounds and go to 10 pounds and go to 15 pounds you don't jump to 100 pounds right but from his viewpoint he can't see what i'm describing at all why because they can only see what they want to see this is where the narcissistic component comes into play right and what you're trying to do in that example is you're treating this person as if they're healthy and they want to give and take and they want to dialogue they don't and so one of the best things you can do, it seems cold, like you were saying, is limit set. Like when a person has like borderline traits or they have borderline, they have all that chaos. So what they do is they, it's like a, they try to transfer it onto you. And then when you start reacting, then they start to feel calm, right? So when you, when you in that example, let's say that that's me, I'm pushing it on you and you're like, no, man, that's fine. Do what you got to do. And you don't respond to me. Then I got to take all that energy back and I have to reflect on what's happening and I have to take responsibility for what's going on inside of me. That's the best thing that you can do for someone 
that's suffering from that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of those basic decisions, in terms of like, they don't see the self-sabotage the way that you would hope that they would. They, because the, the emotions are so strong, right? Mm -hmm. It's so strong and it feels so right, but then they just forget and they move on because it's beyond trauma at that point. Well, that takes us to the next piece then is how do you control or regulate those emotions? This is so depending upon the degree, like I think your provide, I think your example was more like if you're on the lower end and you're kind of in this state of like self sabotaging in your life, then build a routine, take some self awareness. But when you're dealing with like mid to higher end levels, you know, PTSD, you see people come back from war, right? Like, you know, hey, just get over it. Just just start start your life again. It's it's not that simple because the trauma is so bad, right? Mm -hmm. Personality disorder, they're so just disconnected from their body because of all the trauma they went through. It's beyond experience. So they have to really get real professional help, really be self-aware, really take ownership, understand and assess the damage that they've done in their lives, and then start from there. Mm -hmm. And it takes like, you know, intense treatment, two to three hours of group and individual and then going back and forth processing the anger and having that space to do that with and then understanding and reflecting you know that that is what's required hmm. so it's not one of those things that that's important to understand from the standpoint of like if you have a friend that has bpd there is really no amount of time and effort that you can put into that person to help yeah, and if like, you if you don't set boundaries they will take as much as you are willing to give. Yeah, like, uh, you know, I'll give an example, like, you know, with one of the, the clients, like, you know, they're separating from their partner that has BPD. And then the person's struggling because they're like, I, I don't want them to suffer. Mm -hmm. I know that they have it and they're having suicidal thoughts and this is all. So I, then they would go back and sort, but then all the sabotage would keep coming back. So the best thing to do was basically, it was like reversing the thought process. Like, I'm gonna give them the space because this is just feeding into their chaos and they're not gonna change and it's hurting me, I'm gonna set limits. Even though these texts are coming in or these, these, I'm cutting the conversation so that you can reflect and that you can grow and you continue with your treatment so that you can continue to self-reflect. And that, that was a hard pill for that person to swallow. But once they did, the person actually, because it's opposite action, right? They started to normalize themselves and they're having better conversations. Mm -hmm. That was the ultimate gift that you can give to that person. Yeah, that's such a weird thought because if you do have a friend with BPD or heaven forbid you're married to somebody with BPD or at least with a with a diagnosable level of it, it's difficult because you you can care for that person, you can want to help and you can think that you're being kind and supportive by staying, by doing the things that would support which are actually enabling that person. You can there is no amount of time that you can offer and because they're in your lives in a way that's personalized the damage they're doing is also personalized so it's not as if like you know when it comes to um the friend that i spoke about uh several years back uh, it was around that four or five years ago where it was like i start recognizing that it's the same pattern over and over i literally said this needs to be a coaching relationship and a, and a client relationship this is no longer like a friendship because it was it was me having to draw the line because it was him calling and texting and doing things so often that I'm like, this is this is not a normal friendship. And I go, there needs to be a boundary here. And at one point to make him even take it seriously, I was like, you're gonna put a thousand bucks on the table. And if you don't do the things that you say you're gonna do, I'm gonna take it. Because this is this is no longer a friendship. A friend would take advice and would go and do things and then would offer and contribute. But this is not that and you're ignoring everything. So it was setting up those boundaries that actually made it so that he took things seriously. And then not, not to the extent that he's fully turned things around, but to the extent that at least he's getting professional help because I can't be that person. We, we don't, you and I don't have time, a professional, like when we're, we're hired professionally, someone's literally paying us to sit there so that we can provide for our families when we go back home. Right. But if you have a friend that's doing this, you don't have three hours a day to sit there, but they will take three hours a day if you give it to them. And if it's your spouse, you staying in that home and enabling and doing everything and supporting, it's not doing anything. Because on top of not having the ability to understand what's actually happening, like you don't have the clinical experience to know how to treat this, how to approach it. What they're doing is directly damaging you, your family, your children. And so in these cases, people need to understand that usually the most kind thing you can do 
if you're married to someone with BPD that is unwilling to like make changes and it's damaging you, the most kind thing is to separate, is to be setting concrete boundaries and to say, this is as far as this relationship can go until you receive help and support and not be willing to compromise that boundary for anything. No, agreed. And then if you're going to stay in the relationship, it's making sure that the professional help is there. You're you're well educated. You're setting boundaries. You're self caring for yourself and saying right now we're going to put our marriage on pause and we're going to work on you to make sure to get you in a better space and that all all the boundaries and everything is set so that this person can take, you know, that this person can get on the path to getting better. Correct. But but to be clear, from my perspective, staying to me means that it doesn't have to get resolved immediately, but staying to me means ownership. Look, I, I'm, I'm, if I'm going to marry somebody, you know, I'm in it. I'm in it for the, the storms, for the good weather. I'm in it for everything. But I'm not in it if you don't recognize your side of it, if you don't put in the work, if you don't do, like, that's just crazy because that's self, like, I'm literally going to destroy myself because of you. So when you say if you're staying, to me, what's critical to like add to that is it can be worth staying if you have a life and a, and a beautiful family and things that you've built up together and there is the recognition of ownership, ownership and accountability on their side. They're actually acting. Yeah, there has to be, right? Because if not, then everything's getting enmeshed. The, their issues, the couple's issues, it's all getting blended. It gets really chaotic and confusing. But we often see that. We, yeah, often, no, see, yeah. we often see one person staying in the hopes of change when 10 years of evidence has shown that that person has no desire to do so. No, agreed. And this is another important point. If you're the partner that, ha you know, you're the partner that with the partner with BPD, you, you're you developing those personality characteristics too. So you need to check yourself and undo all the residue that's taking place. So oftentimes like people, once they separate, then they'll get in chaotic relationships themselves to a lower degree because they're still internalizing and they've been functioning that way for so long. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Let's go to the last piece of this, which is we kind of talked a little about setting those boundaries about the communication patterns, um, specifically dialectic therapy and what that looks like from a practical standpoint. So if someone has BPD, and I, I love this because despite understanding it, the definition of it, the clinical side of it, um, we were in session together when someone showed this trait and they fully had me engaging. So like, I didn't recognize that it looks so interesting from, from this, this standpoint, because what it looked like to me was someone that was highly engaged. They went from kind of normal to kind of very emotional back to normal, stayed highly engaged, was interested in every single thing that I was, I was saying, would keep asking questions, keep re for someone that educates, it's almost like your your dream student on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're mm -hmm. they seem so into it. Yeah. Then you pointed it out, and you're like, "Did you see the eyes? Did you see the 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 body language? Did you see all the patterns?" And I go, "Holy shit! That is exactly the the I'd never come to recognize the body language and the expression of that like that moment, and it mirrored every other instance of." working with someone that had BPD. Yeah, and then the conversations, right? And then the emotions didn't match what was being said, right? Correct. It was all opposite and it flipped, right? So that is when you can kind of see like the early on characteristics. So you're right, like people will be like, oh, this person is just, they're just sharing their feelings and it's really confident, but then there's a little pause and it was a little exciting and it was, there was a high energy to it, but that, those are the early signs that this person had it, for sure. Yeah, and, yeah. and it can be, it will feel like they're actually listening, like they're taking it in, they're, but you're going to repeat the whole thing again. You're going to, it's not being absorbed. And so you can go and spend a lot of time explaining and helping and guiding. And it's going to have no effect whatsoever. But what actually works is dialectic therapy. Yeah. And dialectical means that multiple things can be true at the same time, right? So mm -hmm. borderline is when you're so caught up in your emotions and you're, you, you feel the need to self-sabotage and the impulse control issues. Are there it's basically saying look there's five things that can be true i feel this way but also like you're a good person i'm still a good person so you're you're thinking things through you're being mindful um and then one of the things i love about dialectics is opposite action 
knowing that you're going to self-sabotage, you have to train yourself to do the opposite of what you impulsively want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Practically, this sounds almost cruel. When you, if you don't recognize, like if you just see two people talking and one person speaks dialectically to the other, you would say that the dialectic person might be emotionally abusive. I, at least that would be the outside perception of it. What you're not realizing is that they have to speak that way to this person because this person is not it, it has has borderline personality you're just disorder. Being, you're, you're, not, you're just being you're just being short and you're being efficient with your time. It does sound it it sounds cold. But because you're not you, I'm not saying like, hey man, shut up. It's just like, okay, you're probably right. You're probably okay. right. Emotionally like, abusive is, like, is ah, extreme. Ah, okay, man. I, I guess I don't understand. So but anyway, uh, I got to go or, but you know, I, that's, that's what I mean. Like yeah. if someone walks up on this conversation, I mean, yeah, emotionally abusive, fine. But you would you would blame the person that is using dialectic therapy for the issues in that relationship if you didn't understand what was happening. And I, I want to give it a contextual example so they can actually like, you know, see what, exactly what I'm no, I, I, you know, I, I, I can see the visual now. Like we're at a coffee shop and yes. someone's crying. And they're ah, and you're like, look, man, it's all good, but I'm going out. They're like, this person's a dick. Exactly. This person's walking out. What an asshole. Yeah, yeah. From the outside, it looks like it's the other person's yeah, fault. Yeah. So if we're at the coffee shop and since we went there, right, mm. we're married and I'm like, Glenn, I just can't take this anymore. And I'm, I'm breaking down. You just don't get it. You just don't know what it's like to be me. And you can't, you can't understand the fact that I went and did those things that I did, but I did it because I love you and I did it because like, like you just don't understand me and I need to, and I'm, I'm bawling. And what would be your response? You're right. I don't understand. Um, but we're still going to go through the divorce. Can we still talk about that right now? Or is this something that we can't do? That's what I mean by it. it looks as though you're the one that is causing the issues. It looks like you're the one that's the dick. Because it does, you don't understand the outside perspective. And that's, that's what I, it, to me, it's very important to recognize this because if a person actually understands their spouse has BPD and they're setting those boundaries, or if your friend has it and they're setting those boundaries and you just happen to, you can often be pulled into those conversations by the person that has BPD because a very common thing that they would do is they would start to triangulate, right? Yeah. Triangulation causing chaos. So All triangulating is, is is going and pulling a third person into it and saying, you know, so and so thinks that I'm right and that, you know, this is not the way to do this or or my marriage counselor says this and that this is your problem. That's what ends up happening is that you get pulled into the BPD's tornado. And you think that it's the other person's fault because they're setting concrete boundaries. No, and, and you're right. Like, this is another issue. And this is, once again, this is not fictitious with clients. The people that are actually separating from the person with BPD, you're right. They, they talk shit about the partner. They go around telling these sob stories, trying to defame them. And everyone's like, Correct. yeah, you are a dick. You are such an ass. And then, you know what? They take it because they're, you know what? I don't care because at this point, you don't know what I've been through. So I'm just going to be a dick. I've already had a dick in my eye anyway, right? So I'm just going to move on and I'm just going to live my life. And that's that's part of breaking away because that's, I was, you know, with the clients, I let them know, like, that's a reminder of the tornado that they're still living in. This is yeah. what you're leaving, right? So, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it, to me, it's, it's, it's critical to understand because I feel like people often will be pulled into these kind of issues. Uh, when I say often, I mean, like, not only have I experienced this, but in almost every scenario, when someone comes to me and says, you know, I need help. I'm getting divorced. I ask them who they've spoken with and they go through a, a list of people. It's just natural that when you're going through that process, you speak with people, right? Both sides are going to speak and look for support to see like, am I, is this the right decision? Is this what's going on? So it's very common for both of them to go out and seek support, but the BPD person is going to be the one that goes and tries to rile everybody up to go against the other. And they're going to and it very much does look like the other person has the issues. The other person is cold. The other person is, you know, uh, often labeled as emotionally abusive because they don't understand. They they say things like, you know, OK, I understand, but I still need to sign the divorce paper. Is that OK with you today? If you didn't know what was going on. I, people would think that you're the biggest asshole in the world. No, no, it's completely true. But also, like if you're the friends in that example, like if you're the friends, you're the family member in that example, and then they're just telling the sob story, 
but then they're not sharing any accountability on that side on their side that's a sign that maybe something's not right with this person too like you should sure. have discernment as a friend or family member for sure yeah for sure so that was just something that i i, I kind of wanted that's, a, to point that's a good point um last thing we already talked about remission rates but just to reiterate like if you're in this place you know understand that when a person's actually working through this as an adult we're looking at 10 15 25 years for remissions of consistent treatment yes. of consistent treatment yeah. so if you want to gauge of like whether i should stay or not you really have to balance how this is affecting you with the expectation that this is going to be a if they're committed to this you know it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that there won't be immediate improvements again depending on like where they're at but what it's important to understand is that as an adult if they're committed to treatment it's going to take time so you have to weigh that time against what's happening right now yeah and then you're going to have to like as a partner you're going to have to redefine what your expectations are in this relationship Correct. right because you can't expect like it's going to be all this kind of normal thing it's going to be treatment it's going to be getting your needs met but understanding that this person needs help at the same time making sure you get help mm -hmm. right so it becomes a different foundation for what the relationship is with this person absolutely dude that's it for this episode i feel like this is one of our best episodes that we've done i think we covered a lot man hopefully a lot it gives context and you know once again we're not trying to marginalize or shrink it down we're just trying to give it some context yeah the uh what i would add to this is uh just to kind of wrap things up we have an online coaching program which is quarterly basically where we do enrollment right we call it crystal clarity this is our first individual coaching program and what i would say is that if you have borderline personality disorder that might not be the right program for you generally if you have bpd what we would encourage you to do is work more in a one-on-one -on -one setting with your uh, with a qualified coach, you can work with Dr. Glenn, um, join the waitlist for that. So we have waitlist on 12 week relationships for individual coaching, or I should say one-on-one -on -one coaching. And there's also a enrollment waitlist for crystal clarity, but there, a person with BPD or any of these like kind of more high level, uh, diagnoses would need quite a bit of time and attention, uh, maybe more so than would be available in like a group setting. So that's why I would typically say they need more specialized care. They need more specialized yeah. care for sure. Yeah. Um, so you can consider that option. Uh, if this is something that you're kind of struggling with, or if you have someone that's struggling with this, feel free to sign up for one-on-one -on -one coaching with Dr. Glenn. Again, for everybody, we have our group coaching programs, all everything is available through the newsletter. So as we have things come up, um, as we're announcing new enrollment periods, all of that, it goes in the newsletter. And the awesome thing is that every single newsletter, adds value to your guys' lives on a weekly basis. These are handwritten letters. These are handwritten messages, I should say, that come directly from us, from our clinical experience, things that you can bring into your daily life to help improve all the relationships that you have around you right away. No spam. So, no spam. Sign up for that at 12weekrelationships.com. And uh, well, that's it for us. Yeah. Another Oh, wait, we got to mention the review thing. Another. Oh, oh that's right. Completely five star reviews. free way. So the newsletter is completely free. Another completely free way <laughs> to just help us out. If you enjoyed this episode and what we're talking about is jump onto iTunes and leave the podcast a five star review and tell us what you think about it. And if you have critique or feedback, send DM it to us. Him. DM us. Specifically him. No, go give it to him. Uh. No, just reach <laughs> us out to us on uh, 12 Relationships on Instagram. Send us your notes, thoughts, any questions, things you might want us to address in the future. That's it for us. We hope you all enjoyed. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you.